Um, there we go. So thanks everyone uh, for having me here today. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be with you all here at Brock University. Uh, my name is Simon Chow. I'm the head researcher for a company called Diversity Research. And this is gonna be a beginner to intermediate level session. And really the goal is to give you an overview and some practical tips and resources that you can actually start to try out for yourself and hopefully implement uh, in your teaching practice. So I'm gonna start with just a quick introduction of myself and the research that we're doing. And then we're gonna get right into the presentation. So a little bit about me, our, our team has been funded by the province of Ontario in April of this year to research the intersection of AI and education. And we're gonna be compiling all of our findings into a final report that will be available for the ministry as well as for the public in spring of 2024. And our research objectives are number one, to investigate how is AI being used by instructors and students today. And that's really uh, what a big part of what the survey is about that Matt mentioned. We wanna understand what are the risks and benefits of using AI in education. We wanna know what are the best ways to use AI for teaching and learning. And finally, what kind of resource and, is, and training do educators need to best leverage these new AI tools? And so this presentation is sort of a, a part of that last point here where we're, um, you know, in the course of our research, we're trying to put together materials and training that we think uh, can be a benefit to educators today. So today on the agenda, we're going to start with a quick chat about what are large language models, LLM, what you need to know about them and how they work. That's going to set up some of the conversation later on about tools and how to best use them. We're going to do a, a live demo in ChatGPT. We'll pull it up together and talk about prompting. We'll look at prompt engineering and how to get the most out of the prompts that you're using in, in ChatGPT. Then we're going to talk about the risks of using large language models, what to watch for and be cautious of uh, when you're using them. Then we're going to do a section on you know, how to integrate large language models into learning, how to bring those into your classroom in a productive and safe way. We don't want to fight these trends. We probably want to move with them. And then finally, we're going to look at some preliminary results from our uh, AI and education survey, which I've mentioned before. So we had a, about 1,100 educators across the province that have filled out the survey so far. We're going to share some of the interesting findings uh, from that survey with you. And then we're going to close. And we'll have some Q&A and discussion at the end of the presentation. So to begin with, we could just start with a, a quick audience participation question. Um, if you could share in the chat, how often do you use generative AI and what is your favorite use case so far? And while that's happening, I'm just going to quickly put in the chat a link to uh, these presentation notes in case anyone uh, wanted to follow along. And as you're typing in the chat, I'll tell you one of the worst uses I, I've heard of ChatGPT recently. Uh, some of you may have seen the story where uh, a lawyer used ChatGPT to create a bunch of uh, case citations and then didn't really validate it, didn't edit it, just sent it off to the judge. And it turned out that all of those cases were fake and none of, the, the, none of them were real. And he was later sanctioned and fined uh, by the court uh, for those actions. And this is a story actually from May of this year, but I was as I was looking for this link, I found that this, this has happened already um, multiple times again since then. Um, so this is something that we're probably going to keep hearing more of, not just in the legal field, um, but in all kinds of fields. So we'll just take a look at the responses here. Matt's saying he's using it five times a week, making his hack coding skills amazing. That's awesome. His son used it to create a... Dave's son used it to create a backstory for his Dungeons and Dragons character. That's awesome. Using Mike is using ChatGPT to test his essay questions, but he's worried that students are using the AI tools to write their essays. Definitely a, a problem that we're going to talk about later today. Uh, Katrina says she's never used it. Kimberly says maybe once a week. I like to use it for information when I need to write copy. These are all great uses and, and concerns and... Um, one of the best things about this technology is there's no, no limits on how you can use it. You can try to use it for anything. And most of the time typing a prompt just takes a minute or two. And if it doesn't work out, you can get back to your day and you've only lost a minute or two. Whereas, you know, and if you're trying to code a project, like for a normal human, it would probably take you a few hours to code something. Whereas now you can kind of mock something up very quickly uh, in a tool like ChatGPT, which really just gets things uh, moving along a lot more quickly. 
Um, so let's talk about what are large language models. Uh, this is a, a brief definition. Software, large language models are a software that uses deep learning techniques and massive data sets to understand, summarize, generate, and predict new content. So there's a key, a few key points here in this definition that we really want to follow up on, mostly on data and on predicting new content. So all of these large language models are trained by a huge corpus of training data. And it's very difficult to find good hard answers on what type of training data specifically these companies are using. Um, the AI space is very competitive now. It's worth billions, if not trillions of dollars. Uh, and for a lot of these AI companies, they believe that their unique training data is their competitive edge against their com uh, comp competition. In the sense that if you have the best, most unique training data, you can your model will be better uh, in ways that no your competition's model may not be. And as a result of that, there's really poor transparency from AI companies about the data that they're using to train their models. Um, also part of it, I think, is there's concern about copyright and privacy issues. Some of this data, I think, was just downloaded off the internet before anyone was really thinking this way about training data. Um, and so these companies are very, um, let's say, cagey and restrictive on what they, they will admit to. But we can more or less assume that the whole internet has been consumed um, by some of these models for the purposes of training. So some of the, for ChatGPT, some of the sources are rumored to include Wikipedia, Reddit, Twitter, millions of unique web pages, uh, thousands if not millions of online books, knowledge sharing platforms like Quora and Stack Overflow are really useful for these models because they provide a lot of con context of here's a question, here's an answer, and those answers get upvoted. Um, so the, the model can really learn like what, what is a quality answer to a quality question. Uh, there's a lot of ethical issues with the training uh, data, as well as with the reinforcement learning process that goes along with it. Uh, that's a little bit outside the scope of this uh, presentation, so I'm not going to go into that, but just something I wanted to flag um, in case you're interested in reading on that further. So the question is, who produces most of the content in these training data sets that get used by these models? So who writes most of the content on the internet? It's hard to find good, solid information on this, um, but we know that it's really mostly English speaking males are predominantly the ones that are posting uh, information onto the internet. We have some data about Wikipedia because this is something that they actually track very closely in terms of Wikipedia editors um, for the purpose of managing systemic bias within their articles. So Wikipedia itself is about 80 to 90% written and edited by males. Averaging age between 15 and 49, 20% are American, mostly from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so that's Wikipedia, which is probably a skewed sample. Um, but I think for the internet more broadly, these are probably in the right ballpark, at least still skewing in this direction. And that can, because that's the tr data that these models are trained for, that can manifest its way um, into bias in these models. So for example, uh, uh, this is from a paper from Mike Healy, where he was prompting a, a, a AI called Midjourney. So Midjourney, you can just give it text and it will generate an image for you. So in this example, the prompt was, was simply a doctor giving instructions to a nurse, busy hospital hallway. And Midjourney just made the assumption immediately that, well, it's a doctor. It must be some older white gentleman. And the nurse will be a younger white female nurse. So we didn't tell it that, but it just sort of inferred that based on what it has seen in its own trading data. In this example here, it's a polar bear wearing a tie teaching a classroom of students in school uniforms. And we didn't specify that this is a school for you know, white boys, but we noticed that in this image, there are no girls, there seems to be no students of color. Uh, so Midjourney has just sort of made the assumption that if your teacher is wearing a tie, you must be at some really fancy school and probably all your classmates are, are white boys. And I guess there's a polar bear there <laughs> as well, somehow. Um, and so these models are ultimately, uh, you know, that was an image, an example of an image generating model, but we're mostly focusing on um, text models today. Uh, they're mostly just text predictors. And I don't want to get too into the weeds here on the, the technical aspects of these things, but probably the simplest way to think about ChatGPT or a large language model like that is it's it's kind of like a super advanced autocorrect. It's it's basically just predicting the next string of words uh, based on the words that it has read in this huge corpus of training data. So within this data, it says, well, your question looks a lot like this. 
And the answers that made sense looked a lot like that. So it will kind of try to recreate that type of a situation. Um, so here an example, if it's, if it's the question was the cat set on the, it's trying to predict the next word here and it would have some probability distribution around is the most likely next word is a table, is it chair, is it mat? Um, and then it would probably pick the word that has the highest probability and continue going from there. Much like when you start texting in your phone, hey, sorry, I'm running. And then it'll know that the next word is probably you're running late. You're probably not running a marathon and apologizing for that, right? Um, and another key thing here is because it's really just an autocorrect type system, it's really just predicting text. It's not postulating truth. It doesn't really understand a lot of the material um, that it's creating and, and writing and discussing. It just knows what the patterns of text are that it has seen in its trading data when discussing those topics. And this is going to become very important later um, when we talk about the risks of using LLMs. So even OpenAI uses this phrase, it calls it plausible sounding, but incorrect or nonsensical answers. It's a bit of a garbage in, garbage out problem. And any type of bias issues that we saw before in the trading data will manifest themselves in the results in ways that may be very subtle and hidden to us. So now we're going to move to a, a live demo of ChatGPT. And before we do that, I just want to reinforce this point here. It's just... There's a lot of talk about prompt engineering and just the word engineering makes it sound very technical. It feels a lot like programming, um, but ultimately this is just a very conversational tool. And so I just want to say, just keep it simple. And it's, it's really, it's not, you're gonna see that it's really not that complicated. Just keep it conversational and keep it iterative. Understanding that most of the time, uh, the first prompt to your AI is not necessarily going to get you the right answer. Uh, sometimes it may take one or two tries um, to get to what exactly what you need. So <clears throat> can all, can everyone still see my screen? I think it's still scaring. Yeah. Um, so this is a, um, a copy of chat GPT here for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, it is available for free. So I'm not going to cover how to sign up today, but you can go to openai.com and just follow the prompts. All you need is an email address and you'll, you'll get started hopefully within, uh, not too long. So just I'll just quickly go over the interface here. Um, this is your main chat window. So this is where you can enter your prompts. I noticed that they make this little um, warning here. ChatGPT can make mistakes. Consider in checking important information. And we're going to come back to that later in the section about risks. There's some kind of fun little prompts here just to get you started. Um, this is your chat history on the left-hand side. So anything that you search for in the past will be showing up here. On the top, there's a section for you to select uh, what type of model you're going to be using. Today in the demo, I'm just going to be using this GPT 3.5, which is the free version of this software. There is a premium version called GPT 4, which I've also been experimenting with. Um, it's about $30 a month. There's a lot of different features. You can do image generation. You can do custom GPTs. They, um, they've really added a lot of great new content into these, this premium model. Um, over the last few weeks, and we can we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for today, we're just focusing on the, the free version uh, that's available to everyone. <clears throat> and down here is the uh, account and settings section, which I'm going to come back to in a little bit when we talk about data privacy and some other settings that are available here in the uh, platform. So to get started, why don't we just start with a, a quick fun prompt to see what we can get out of here. Uh, Write a song about all the things that make Brock University a great place to complete your degree in the style of Eminem. And we'll see what we get here. I'm not gonna try and rap for you, but, <laughs> but we can take a look at the results. Um, we see it's got a pretty good rhyming scheme, flight, light, ignite, unite. Uh, it's talking about books. It's talking about, uh, you know, getting that wealth. It's the foundation of mental health that goes on. Um, and it's actually generated quite a bit of, quite a bit of content here, surprisingly. Um, so, you know, that's basically all you need to get started. Um, by default, uh, chat GPT, you got to focus on the word chat. It's just a chat bot. It's here to, to talk with you. It's default stance is how can I assist you today? If you just, if you just start a chat and say, uh, you know, write something, 
He'll just say, certainly, well, what would you like me to write about? Whether it's a story, an informative piece or a poem. So the personality, if you can really call it that, or the stance of ChatGPT is just like, hey, I'm here to help you. Let's let's discover something. Let's do something together. Um, so its natural inclination is to share information and to help you. And if your prompt is unclear, like in this case where I said, just said, write something, um, often it will come back to you and it'll ask you some follow-up questions. Like, oh, I'm not totally sure what you want me to write about. Um, can you clarify and so on? So um, this is a lot different than computer programming, where if you write something wrong in a computer program, it's going to throw up an error message that makes no sense to you. And you're going to end up Googling it probably. If you're anything like me, you're going to end up Googling that, <laughs> that error for like an hour um, to try and figure out what the right answer is. Um, so in here, the main thing is just keep it keep it informal and and keep it chatty. Um, and also keep it iterative because because sometimes most of the time the first thing that you write um, is not going to get you to the right answer. We're going to take a look at that here. Um, so let's say that we were um, working on a quiz or an assignment, and we we're just drawing some blanks on uh, a few. We needed a few more multiple choice questions to finish it off. So I need some first year university level multiple choice questions on the topic of magnetic fields. Generate 10 questions with A to D answers for each. So we'll try that, see what it comes up with. So it gives us these 10 questions here. And this is looking pretty good. It's been a while since I've I've done magnetic, <laughs> studied magnetic fields myself, but this is looking, this is decent. There's 10 questions here. It has A to D. These are all magnetic field relevant questions. Uh, and so maybe this is good enough. Maybe I'm like, oh, actually, you know, question eight is perfect. I'm ready to go. But one thing I noticed about this list is that it's given me questions A through D, but it doesn't tell me which answer is the right answer. And obviously it makes it easier for me to write the quiz if I knew which answer was the correct one. So I said, um, can you also include the correct answer for each question? And so now, it's gonna give us the question as well as the correct answer here. And let's say we were reading these questions and like, you know what, this feels more like grade 11 or grade 12 high school level physics. This doesn't quite seem what I need. I could, uh, I'm just gonna stop it here and just say, these are good, but the questions say like six through 10 need to be harder. Can you regenerate? And from there, it'll start. So maybe questions one to four were at the right difficulty level, but I said, you know, questions five to 10 uh, need to be more difficult. And so now it's kind of upgrading those questions with a little bit more difficulty for me. Still, and now it's figured out that, oh yeah, every time it generates questions, it wants me to, it wants to, um, I want to see the answers along with it. So already we're getting to a better place here. And then we could say, um, Actually, I like question five, but I want it to be a short answer type question instead. And notice I made a typo here, but that doesn't really matter because generally it's going to figure out um, what I'm trying to do instead. And here now it's, it's changed question five uh, into more of a short answer question that I could use. So this is just like a very simple example of one way that you could use um, ChatGPT just for you know brainstorming and um, content generation. And again, the key principle here is just feel free to, if you don't get what you want right away, that's totally normal. Just kind of tell it what you want. What, what did you not like about his response? You can tell it that. It's really good at taking feedback. It's not gonna get upset with you. Um, and you can keep working with it to iterate and eventually land at something that is um, much better for what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and also the other thing I want to wanted to my quiz, but I asked it for 10 questions. And I find that often when you're this technology, um, the idea of curation is very powerful. Like get it to generate more options than you need, and then you can whittle it down to the options that are most like what you're trying to achieve. So I'm going to put this away for a moment. We're going to come back to the presentation. So those were very basic prompts um, that I showed you. Now, there are also some more advanced prompts and um, different ways of getting a little bit more out of uh, these large language models. 
So one of the key concepts in uh, generating more advanced prompts is there's, there's three of them. First is like providing context or a role. So give the AI some more context before asking it a question. Uh, you want to request a specific task and you want to give very detailed instructions. So in the example that I just looked at, we did have some of these things. So I told it, you know, I want first year university level questions. It's a little bit of context. Um, I asked it to generate the, uh, the 10 questions that I wanted. And I eventually I specified that I also wanted to show me the answers and then I wanted, you know, it to be a little bit harder, those kinds of things. So eventually I kind of got each of these three concepts. Um, but by really leaning into these concepts, we can develop even more powerful prompts and we'll go through each of these individually. So how to give, giving context or assigning a role to an AI, it's kind of just a shortcut way of uh, providing more context in your request. You can ask the AI to act as a industry or subject ex expert, a helpful mentor or coach, another experienced professor, a university researcher, and this will prime the AI um, to think in that way without you having to spell out the, the context of, you know, what is an academic writing style or, um, you know, the, the type of way that maybe a university researcher might write. So by just assigning a role, you can say, hey, you're, you're my uh, teaching coach and I'm trying to improve this assignment or this test that I'm working on. Help me re revise these 10 questions. Um, that's a really great way to provide context to the models. Uh, is you want to really give a specific task. So again, as much context as you can give. Um, and there's some phrases that you can use um, with large language models that are, are somewhat like a cheat code. And what's really interesting about something like ChatGPT is that uh, there is no manual for these large language models because a lot of the thinking that they do is emergent and not necessarily traceable. Nobody coded it to with a logic to generate multiple choice questions. It kind of just figured out what are multiple choice questions and it worked from there. And so actually a lot of the recent research into um, large language models has been trying to essentially derive a user manual based on um, just utilizing the technology. So one, uh, there's a recent paper here where they discovered this term, let's think step by step, can actually improve the accuracy of the model by as much as five times when it comes to certain calculation or mathematical problems. So there's, strangely enough, there are certain kind of cheat codes and terms that you can use that will get you vastly different results um, from these large language models. Another one that I read about recently is actually capitalizing. If you put something in all caps, the, the model will see that as very important, which is a lot like the way that uh, we write when we text. So if you, if you really don't want the model to do something, if you say do not in all capitals, um, it will take that instruction a lot more seriously than if you just write do not in you know normal lowercase. Um, so those are some, that's an interesting area of research that's still developing, um, but those are some things that you can start using right away. Another good one is just go one at a time, waiting for my feedback before proceeding. So maybe you have kind of like a multi-stage thing, like maybe you're trying to write a, a, a long email and you're like, okay, well, first I want you to generate an outline based on these parameters and then wait for my feedback on the outline before we proceed to actually generating the text. Um, and these are some words that you can ask the LLM um, to work with you using. So assist, help, write, rewrite, refine, summarize, expand, connecting ideas, generating alternatives. Just state the objective that you want to achieve and how you want the AI to help you. Just say, I'm trying to write this email, but I'm struggling on uh, the right way to word this complicated concept. Can you help me? That's sometimes all you need. Um, and finally, uh, just some parameters here for different types of structures um, that we can give to the AI to improve the type of output we get. So consider elements like length. You can give a word or a character limit. You can give a you know, number, number of examples. So earlier I said, give me 10 multiple choice questions. It could have been five, it could have been 20. Um, what is the format that you want? Is it an email? Is it a memo? Is it an outline? Is it just brainstorming? What is the structure? Do you want bullet points? Do you want an executive summary? Do you want an enable format? What is the style? Business writing, academic writing, formal, informal. Um, these are all different uh, ways that we can kind of help shape the output from the AI. And often I find these ones are useful because it tends to be a little bit stiff. And in general, most of the time it writes too much. 
Uh, so I find myself using things like as, as few words as possible, be as concise as possible. Those types of phrases tend to be quite helpful. Um, so this is a, a slide here just about data privacy settings for ChatGPT. So by default, um, ChatGPT will take the data that you put into it in terms of your prompts, like the, the back and forth that you have, and it will use that to further refine its model. So you can imagine that, um, you know, this, this system can be improved by like, it just looks at the conversations you have and say, okay, this seems like a response that the, the customer was happy with. We're giving that one a thumbs up or this person came and was looking for this. They prompted a bunch of times and it seems like they left frustrated. And so they're using that data to ultimately um, try and improve their model. Um, however, for most of us, I think we don't want that, especially in the education space. Um, so if you follow this link, it will take you to a website where you can make a privacy request. And by filling that out, that will tell OpenAI uh, not to use your any of your data in any type of training uh, whatsoever. Um, there is also a, um, that's if you want to retain your chat history. And remember, so the chat history is here, which I actually find um, quite useful because sometimes I'll come back to, I want to know what, what did it, what was that? great rap song about Brock that I had yesterday. So I'll come back to things. Um, so I like the chat history, but if you don't care about the chat history, you can also go here to the settings page um, under data controls and just disable um, chat history and training completely. And that won't save any of your chat history and it will they won't use any of your data uh, for training. The other uh, setting in here that I wanna bring to your attention is this one, which is called custom instructions. So I was just speaking about how assigning a role and giving context to the AI is really important, and that can help you get much better results from your prompting. What custom instructions basically does is it allows you to provide a context for the AI every single time you come to prompt it. So you could type something in here like, I am a university professor teaching primarily first and second year physics. My specialization is in these topics. I'm mostly using ChatGPT for these reasons. Um, something like that. You can add up to 1500 uh, characters of context here. And then how would you like ChatGPT to respond? You could add things like those um, detailed instructions that I talked about, like always give me bullet points unless I specify otherwise, always use academic language, always be as concise as possible, um, something like that. So you can put those, uh, any, any type of those custom instructions here. And now once you save that, Going forward, anytime I come in, in to prompt the AI, it will already know that I'm a first or second year physics professor. It will already know that my preference is, is for academic style and tone or bullet point answers or anything that you, um, or if you want to put your the name of your Dungeons and Dragons character um, in here, it'll help you <laughs> develop even like more interesting quests, right? So this is kind of a, a good shortcut to use if you find that you're often coming to ChatGPT to try and do um, very similar tasks. <clears throat> so let's talk about the risks of using large language models. This is a cover from the New Yorker uh, recently. I don't know how many of you can kind of relate to this feeling where you're you're stuck on something. You're like, oh, great. I'll use this uh, awesome new AI assistant that I have. And it produces something for you that's like, you know, it's ordered in a way, but it, it's not exactly what you had in mind. And so this is an experience that I think a lot of us have had. And this is the concept of prompt engineering and being iterative um, and, and working with it, providing feedback to the model, trying to get us to, to a better final state. Sometimes these, these AIs do not have a lot of context. So if you ask it to generate an image of when the base drops, it may generate an image of when the bass is dropping instead. And that may not be what you're looking for. So sometimes these models do not have a very good idea of the um, the context. And that's why giving them context or using the custom instructions uh, is so important. So I created this chart of just sort of some areas that LLMs are good and bad for. And this is just to give you some understanding of what are the areas in high and low risk when you're using these types of models. So in general, current LLMs are pretty good for, they're good for brainstorming, idea generation, it's good for a starting point to help fight a blank page syndrome. If you're just like struggling, like how do I even begin putting some thoughts together on this? Um, it'll give you, you can generate a document and you can edit from there. It's great at summarizing. Uh, if you have a long document, you just want to sort of summarize in a couple sentences. 
or expanding. If you just have a couple sentences, but you want to sort of flesh it out a lot more, editing or refining, rewording or creating quick alternatives. Also, often I'll come to ChatGPT if I'm writing something, there's a couple sentences that just feel really awkward and I'm not sure how to you know, reword them. It's really good for that. Um, you can use ChatGPT for a tone check. Am I being a jerk in this email right now? I think that's one of the more useful things because we've all we've all sent an email in haste emotionally and then later realize like uh, that was not the best way to to say that. In general, LMs are bad for retrieval of specific facts or information. They're not very good at deep understanding and reasoning for the for the reasons that we talked about earlier. They often don't really understand a lot about what they're saying. Um, Current and recent events, they often don't have knowledge of. The free version of ChatGPT, uh, last I checked, is trained up until January 2022. Um, however, there are large language models now, such as Bing Chat, which is free through Microsoft Edge, which I really, this is probably, Bing Chat is probably the best um, free large language model that's available. It's based on ChatGPT4, and it can search the internet. Um, so those systems are a little bit better around anything that would be recent, because they can actually Google a question and, and read the results. Um, and ChatGPT Pro can also search the web now. Um, LMs are generally bad for most math calculations. However, the let's think step-by-step -step, uh, makes a big difference on anything that's kind of calculation-based. Um, there are some other special AIs available for that that like connect to programs like Wolfram Alpha and so on. Um, differentiating between information and misinformation. LLMs don't really have a good concept of that. And there's some specific word requests that uh, they are not good at. Surprisingly, word counts. You would think that this would be something that an AI could do really well. I've really struggled with this one where I ask it to do maximum 500 words and it'll give you like 600. And then you have to tell it like three times um, to give you a lower word count. Um, rhyming is another weird one. If you ask it to write a poem with no rhymes, it will continuously write you poems with rhymes in them. Like it doesn't understand the concept of a poem that doesn't rhyme unless you tell it specifically like write a haiku or something. Um, so there's some kind of weird edge cases um, where the LMs are not that strong, but they'll probably get better at those things over time. And as I found with word counts, if you yell at it enough, it'll eventually um, reinforce like a word count for you. And maybe probably the let's think step by step for the word count would probably help. I haven't tried that yet. So when it comes to the risk of using LLMs, the most important thing is to trust nothing and to question everything. Everything that you comes out of an LLM cannot be immediately trusted. Most of the information is easily fallible. Um, even OpenAI, as I said earlier, uses this language that it will generate plausible sounding, but incorrect or nonsensical answers. They say that the AI is no source of truth and is vulnerable to leading questions and prompts. So we have to be very careful um, anytime we're looking at information we retrieve from large language models. You can ask a large language model to give you uh, references or to articles, but often they will give you fake references. And as we saw in the case of the lawyer with his um, his fake cases, those seemed like real cases, but they were just completely made up based on, you know, the model thought that it, it would be like, you know, this response would be a lot better if I could cite some cases that looked like this, and then it would just make up those cases um, based on that. <clears throat> and as well, the issues with the training data. So we talked about bias. There's also a lot of copy issues around copyright. Um, these models were trained on a lot of data that arguably was consumed without uh, right credit to the, the, the writers or the, the copyright owners. Um, again, that's not really in the scope of this presentation, but something definitely to be aware of, as well as herd mentality. If we're training most of these models on very similar data sets, they're all gonna start to kind of crowd and move in that same direction, which is probably something that we don't really want. So let's talk about communicating and integrating AI into education. This is one of the things that we heard uh, very predominantly in the survey comments. How do we find a middle ground that makes use of AI without compromising skills developments and learning outcomes that we have in our classrooms? Fundamental to all of this is transparency. This is the, the core principle, I believe. Um, this is really new technology. And I don't think it's it's not fair for anyone to expect anyone else to really be an expert in this yet. We can't expect students to be experts. We can't expect each other as educators to be experts. So recognizing that we're all learning this together and creating a safe space for discussion, I think is, is critically important. Um, so if we can start with transparency, we build it up through communication and reflection, and ultimately we can achieve integration together. So transparency, I think really begins with being specific about per, per, permitted uses. Um, and uh, the core idea here is 
uh, scaffolding. So breaking your assignment into a sequence of smaller activities, and you would invite AI use for some of those activities and probably not invite AI use for other parts of those activities. So for example, if it was like a, a research report or an essay, you might break it into uh, five sections like this, where you know in the topic selection focus and focus, outline preparation, you might say, yeah, use, use large language models as much as you want for those sections. Um, and then when the research phase, you could say use it with, with high caution, right? And we could talk about what that means. And then for the drafting phase, you would say no usage of AI for that portion. However, you can come back to the AI at the end um, for some help with review potentially and editing. I'm just like, ah, like I said, the transition between these paragraphs is weird. Could you help me refine it a little bit? That would be one way to approach it. And I think alongside this, what's really important is to demonstrate these uses. So, you know, pull up ChatGPT in class and go through the outline preparation together or talk, you know, talk to the AI about how to pick a topic for this particular paper. Um, show examples of the kinds of conversations you can have. And the idea here is that you, you want to create that safe space where students are watching you prompt the AI and they can raise their hand and ask a question of like, well, I, I see you're doing this with the AI, but is it okay if I do that instead? And that gives you the chance to, you know, in front of every whole class to say, well, what do we think? Is this a, uh, is this a good use? Is it not a good use? Um, you want to bring those questions out in class early. You don't want students trying to answer those questions themselves at like 2 a.m. the night before the assignment is due. And so you really want to be clear about the um, citation and policy. What is your expectations for citing AI content if you have some? And you want to make sure that you're explaining the relevant academic integrity policies as well. So another big question we saw uh, in our survey uh, data so far has been, how can I stop students from using generative AI in writing, set, in writing assignments? Uh, one simple answer is to just try to use different assessment methods where possible. And this is not always um, doable, but a simple approach, right? You could try presentations, either individuals presenting to the class or presenting in small groups to each other. Um, you can try in-class activities instead writing in class or pen and paper has seen a bit of a renaissance recently, group discussion, you could do quizzes or tests, case studies, you could try multimedia assignments instead, like record a video discussing this, produce an infographic, record a little podcast discussion. Um, these are all uh, new types of assessment methods that are available to us. Another possible approach is what I'm calling the, the go big approach. And the basic idea here is to allow like a lot of AI usage, but to make your assignments substantially harder, requiring more work and really requiring students to leverage the AI to even develop new skills that they may not have. And this is an approach that's um, been popularized by Ethan Mollick, who has a great blog and a lot of great research on this topic. Um, an example of this could be in a business writing class Normally, the assignment would be to create a business plan for a software company, but instead, you might ask students to, I want you to actually develop a working website that states all, this is the company, all their products and services, um, you know, some, you know, working contacts, forms, and a, an investor pitch deck. Uh, and the assumption there is that, you know, students could use the AI to teach themselves how to, how to create a website. I more or less did that myself, <laughs> teach, taught myself to make websites that way. Uh, and, it, and it works. Um, so that's, it's not always feasible for every topic, um, but it's one thing that you can consider. The other uh, option, if, if that's not going to work for you, is we can move to something that's being called assessment redesign. So we're trying to develop a framework here that will um, combine some concepts that will allow you to integrate AI in some productive ways in your assignments without totally turning your back on uh, the learning outcomes that you have. So the best way to think of this is that each one of these principles is like an ingredient and we can combine these ingredients in unique ways, depending on uh, your assignment, your course, your students um, to create an assessment that um, leverages AI in, in creative ways. So we'll go through each of these individually. Uh, scaffolding, we already talked about this a little bit, but it is really important. You really wanna make sure that you're demonstrating what are the appropriate ways uh, to use AI in these types of situations. Um, so for example, you could request students use AI for some of their pre-writing activities, refining their topic through AI conversation, generating an outline, finding sources, et cetera. So you could say, use your AI for just these sections. Um, and then once you hit this point, 
you can't use it anymore. Um, and that would be one way to do it. Flipped classroom. This has been around for a while, but it's uh, it's becoming more important than ever. Um, there's been current research out there that's starting to tell us that people are more productive when they're using AI. There was a recent uh, study done by the Boston Consulting Group where they took a group of uh, consultants who were very, very lightly trained in using AI. And then they took another uh, control group of consultants who had no access to AI whatsoever. And they had them do a whole bunch of very common, you know, consulting business work tasks. And they found that on every metric they measured, the group that was working with AI was more productive. They had higher quality results uh, than the control group who was not using AI. So we're starting to see more and more evidence that people can be more productive with AI. And the idea here with the flipped classroom is allowing students to leverage um, the high, predict high productivity work that they can do at home, potentially AI and then bringing that type of work into class where we can focus on the critique and the review and the critical thinking skills together. So an example might be um, students creating a detailed outline at home, and then in, they bring that outline from the AI into class, and then in class they are handwriting um, part of their draft, maybe an introduction or a few um, paragraphs of their paper. Another one is critique. Uh, so this is an important one as it helps students learn how to prompt AI effectively, as well as how to be critical and skeptical towards AI output. So as I said earlier, we want to trust nothing and we want to question everything. And so by, <clears throat> by establishing critique as kind of a fundamental um, part of working with AI, this will hopefully reinforce that concept to students and teach them the right ways to think critically about working with AI. Um, this is kind of building a bit on the previous two ideas. So um, one example would be students working with an AI to generate a written work, and then they write a critique of that AI's work, talking about the strengths, weaknesses, um, areas that they could improve. And that could be a pre-writing assignment, or that could be the whole assignment itself. Another idea is the, this idea of individualization. So by encouraging to relate course material to their own life or experience, we can not only help foster a deeper reflection and connection, but also push the assignment in directions that are a little bit harder for AIs to replicate. So you could ask them questions about their hometown, family, campus, relating course material to their own lived experience. So for example, what concepts, ideas, choices did the writer make that you could relate to in some way? Do your experience conflicts with this piece or draw three connections between the reading and content from lectures? So these are questions that it's a little bit harder to get AI to work productively on right away and as well as kind of pushing students to reflect a little bit more deeply about the things that they're learning. And then we get to reflection here. So this is the idea, this is an idea you can kind of layer in with uh, some of the other concepts. Um, I've, I spoke to one school who with every assignment now, they're asking students to submit a short questionnaire that asks them, how much did you use AI for this? What sections did you use it for the most? Where was it useful? Where was it not useful? Did it write anything that surprised you? Um, what would you do differently next time? So the idea kind of here is like anytime you're allowing some AI use, it may be a good idea as well to have a reflection questionnaire that goes along with it. And that just pushes students to think, again, a little bit more deeply about what they're doing. Because I've been using AI very regularly for the last almost year now. And I can tell you that there's certain things that I don't use it for anymore because it just doesn't really doesn't save me time. Like, for example, if I, if I don't know what I want to write, it's hard to get the AI to work. If I kind of already know this is what I want to say, help me express this, it can work. But if I'm just kind of stumbling around in the dark, um, I end up just wasting a lot of time using AI that way. So reflection is important because it's it helps them kind of self-assess their own learning, but also self-assess these tools um, and ask themselves, is this really helping me or is it just kind of wasting my time? And finally, the last principle is uh, conversation and role play. So we can actually create more detailed prompts that will push the AI to take on a certain role or force a certain type of specific dialogue for the student. And this is actually like a direction that OpenAI seems to going, be going explicitly with this technology. So I mentioned that they had a, a number of really important releases of their dev day a couple of weeks ago. One of them was this idea of what they're calling custom GPTs. So uh, in the premium version, I can create a custom GPT that I, you know, 
feed it the works of Shakespeare. I feed it the, you know, some commentary on Shakespeare. I tell it, um, you know, the way, the types of questions I wanted to ask students. And then um, I can share that with other people. And essentially you would just log into, you click my link to a GPT and all of a sudden you would be in conversation um, with Shakespeare or something like that, right? So um, role-playing, I think, and specific role-based AIs will be a very um, big area of growth going forward. And there's a little short example here about um, how you can essentially set up an AI that will kind of uh, have a, like an oral kind of quiz, let's say, with a student, right? And the student could submit this kind of whole conversation um, as part of their assessment. And these things can be quite fun and, and you can have quite a bit of fun with these role-playing exercises. Okay, so we're now we're gonna uh, move to this, take a look at the survey results that we have from our survey. So these responses were all collected over the last few months, just starting in uh, September of this year. And the survey will be open until uh, the end of November. So these are preliminary results. They are subject to change. Um, unfortunately, that's why I didn't want to include them in the PowerPoint that I shared with you all, just because these are non-final numbers, but we wanted to share uh, some of the important findings that we're starting to see already. Um, so some of the first questions we asked were, how much do you use AI? And one of the findings we had unsurprisingly was that educators with less experience are generally uh, more likely uh, to try using AI in their roles of ed as educators, about like, you know, 78% of teachers or educators with three years or less experience um, and you can see as, as educators get more experience, they tend to use AI um, or have tried AI less in their roles as educators. Uh, similarly, the percentage of educators who would identify themselves as proficient or expert is, again, slowly decreasing um, as you increase in the experience level. And that's probably just because, you know, more experienced teachers have more materials to draw on, more experience um, to go, for, go with. We asked some questions about uh, to what extent would you like to see AI integrated into an education setting? And uh, just to explain this chart here a little bit, the blue section is kind of, is like a neutral, um, wanting to use AI occasionally, just in certain situations. The, the red and the orange is a little bit more hawkish, like either completely banning AI or using it very rarely. And the green sections are a little bit more accommodating, more open to using AI frequently or fully integrating AI um, <clears throat> into education. And so again, we found that educators with less experience on average are more open to um, AI integration than educators who have more experience as, as noted by the kind of the growing red and orange section and the shrinking um, green here. In general, most the most common response is kind of neutral, um, which is to use AI occasionally in certain conditions. Uh, this is a similar chart, but instead of looking at uh, years of experience, we're looking at the grade level of educators. So in general, post-secondary educators, they're more concentrated on the far ends of the spectrum. So they are less likely to choose this kind of a neutral response. They're more likely to favor either totally banning AI or using with tight controls, or um, more likely also to, to favor um, total integration or frequent usage. That's a bit interesting that they tend to be a little bit more, say, extreme in their views on um, AI usage, whereas educators in younger grade levels are a little bit more neutral. Uh, we asked educators to sort of estimate what percentage of their students that they suspect are using AI. And unsurprisingly, um, we're seeing like an increasing trend with college and university level instructors estimating about 55% of their students using AI for their assignments. Uh, we asked what types of training and support levels, what type of training and support would you like to see as an educator? And really across the board, we just had positive response that in general, almost at every grade level, at every type of, of resource and training, um, there was strong demand. Basically, people are looking for <laughs> training and resources in this area. And that's really a, like a big part of our research of, of why we're doing this, trying to develop those types of materials. Um, we asked, does your institution use AI detecting tools such as Turnitin or GPT-0? Uh, we found that many institutions are, particularly in high schools and in colleges. The yes is the red here. So the majority 
of high school and college uh, educators um, indicated that they are using a, a technology, AI detecting with software like Turnitin or GPT-0. Um, we asked educators, does your institution have an AI policy? And we found that actually most institutions do not have an AI policy. Um, or, whoops, there we go. <laughs> um, or they're unsure and, or there's, there's still one being developed at the moment. Um, so there's certainly um, a lot of work to be done here in, in the terms of policy and framework um, space for using AI at institutions. So that concludes the uh, survey data. We'll come back to the presentation. And that concludes the presentation as well. So I want to thank you all so much for your attention. And uh, we do have this brief um, survey here to give some feedback on the presentation, which would be, again, really appreciated if any of you could fill that out. This is, as I said, like a training resource that we are piloting and, and trying to always improve upon. So um, any of your feedback in that regard would be uh, really, really greatly appreciated. Um, as well, if you have any questions on anything specifically, you can reach out to me. My email is here. And I think with that, we can uh, move into the discussion section. And I'm going to um, stop the recording now. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate that.